From the campus of Yale University, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio, WYBC, and 1490 AM, WGCH, Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. How a penniless dropout became the greatest steel maker in history, the quiet financial genius of Kirk Kerkorian. That's tonight on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. William Rempel is a veteran investigative reporter with 36 years' experience at the Los Angeles Times. His reporting triggered government investigations, exposed White House and Pentagon scandals, prompted reforms of state courts, consumer protection laws. He's the author of At the Devil's Table, the untold story of the insider who brought down the Cali cartel. He was a consultant on the Netflix series Narcos. He's produced groundbreaking reports on Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda that were published before the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, and provided extensive coverage of supertanker safety flaws, again, before the 1989 Exxon Valdez disaster. And he's got a new book, The Gambler, How Penniless Dropout Kirk Kerkorian Became the Greatest Dealmaker in Capitalist History. That's a mouthful. Welcome, Bill. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Great, great career you've had. This is a tremendous rags to, uh, to riches story, an American dream with an unknown Armenian uh, I want to yeah. start off, I just got this great sense of paradox. You have this shy guy who went Hollywood, this guy who was a builder who continually traded uh, properties. He was known as a builder in Vegas, a liquidator in Hollywood. Uh, how did you get your arms around who Kirk Kerkorian is? Well, he's a, he's a man of many stories and many sides, and, and that, was, that was part of the fascination. A um, man of contradictions, uh, no education, and uh, yet he... Schooled the, some of the you know, greatest minds in business, so everything I learned about him was was a surprise. There was so many things, and of course, his his penchant for privacy, the way he kept out of the public eye, you know, avoided all the trappings of, of celebrity for most of his life, and um, that that added to the mystery. He didn't really care about money that as much as you would think, right? Well, that's right. He uh, he, he he considered the risk. The um, yeah. the thing that that got him going in the morning, you know, he he loved risk. He was a gambler. He was a gambler in the at the at the tables in Vegas, and he was a gambler in business. And he always always talked about how how the risk was the uh, was the great thrill ride. Did you unmask something that surprised you the most, or you said there's just everything seemed to surprise you? Well, that's the thing. Yeah, uh, there's so many surprises. I mean, starting with um, with the the degree of Poverty from which he grew in the yeah. first place. His his family, uh, his father was, and the family were evicted from the ranch uh, when he was five six years old, and that's about as far from the Forbes list that you're going to get. And uh, and then as he grew up, and in in his early uh, early years, he got into flying and became, and during World War II, he had this incredible career, uh, incredible um, uh, stint as a contract pilot for the Royal Air Force flying uh, air, freshly built fighters and bombers from Canada to the, to the support the Royal Air Force uh, war in, in, in Europe. And, and that was such a perilous, treacherous uh, uh, assignment that uh, 500 of his colleagues uh, perished in the process. So wow. he, was, he was heroic you know, on a level that I had no, no idea going into this, into this research. Um, now, deal making is sort of at the core of his whole uh, persona. So I'll talk a little bit about mm-hmm. about that. He, he talk a, he, he, such a poker face guy with this sort of preternatural calm, right? That's correct. He was you know, called the uh, Perry Como of the craps tables, <laughs> and he had he was noted in the military for his uh, poker face. Uh, they, the guys played played cards all the time, and he, he, apparently you didn't want to play poker with with Kirk. No. But he, but he brought that to the business world too, a a calm and a um, uh, he didn't have a tell, I guess you say when you're across the, the the table from Kirk, in a business negotiation you just never know for sure what uh, what's going through his head. I was also impressed uh, as part of his deal making um, uh, sort of a composite how fair. He was. He was not a guy that looked. Uh, I keep thinking of Trump when I compare the two because they were both in casinos and stuff. And for Trump, winning was everything. Humiliating the other guy was everything. 
and integrity was everything with Kerkorian, and they, they seem like almost opposites in many ways. Plus, oh, Trump obviously opposite. is such a public guy. They were polar opposites in just about every respect, in both manner and temperament and, um, and goals. Uh, Kirk carried no grudges. He considered business a, a I think he considered it a sport, uh, but it wasn't to be humiliating your, your, a good, your, your, uh, your rival. Your, for Kirk, a good deal was a deal that everybody won what they want. You know, everybody was a winner in a good deal. Um, there didn't have to be a loser. And uh, so, and he should, you see that in some of the big deals that he had, for instance, with uh, Ted Turner, who bought MGM from Kirk uh, in the mid '80s. Uh, it, it was a, a, a it, Kirk, uh, Ted Turner came out of that with a, a huge load of debt, and the kind of debt that made him vulnerable to uh, to, to collapse. And um, Kirk could have owned. The entire, everything in Ted Turner's uh, empire, he could have had, as, as Ted Turner was concerned about, that he was going to have, that CNN was going to end up being KNN for mm-hmm. Kokorian Network News. And Kirk could have done that. He, he had the, the edge and the, uh, the, the, the authority, the, the, the contract uh, uh, clout to, to take, take and, and dismember uh, the, the, the Turner Empire and, and take it into his own realm, but he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to squash Ted Turner, and even though his uh, his some of his lawyers and and, and uh, financial people were prepared to help him do it, um, Kirk made a point of renegotiating. He did that with Steve Wynn in, in the Mirage deal. So this was a man who could have could have been a uh, ruthless um, negotiator, and instead was a um, was more of a partner with the people that he did business with. I, I was I was stunned by that both the the, the uh, Ted Turner deal and that the, not only did he do that deal with Steve Wynn, um, but he didn't put a non compete on Steve Wynn just because he didn't feel that was fair, which is is kind of is kind of mind boggling since uh, you know Wynn is such a brand, uh, yes. it's a brand name. Yeah, and it was and it was and it was it was a combination of that and the fact that Kirk truly believed in something called competition. He thought competition was good for him as well as for the other guy, and he encouraged it. He, he didn't want he, it, for him uh, having Steve Wynn build another hotel across the street from from the uh, Bellagio would was a good idea, not a bad one. Uh, Kirk relished the competition. He relished competition from the tennis courts to the to the boardrooms. Yeah. Well, let's, that, that's a good segue into someone that didn't like uh, competition as much. Talk about Howard Hughes uh, and, and the differences between him and uh, Kerkorian, because they both seem eccentric recluses from the outside. Yeah, that's, that's a, it's, false, it's a false uh, uh, comparison, but it, it, it's inevitable, and Kirk hated the comparison personally. But uh, Howard Hughes was a... Um, was it was a was a strange was a was a, um, um, a drug addict and a and a and a, and a, a recluse with, uh, mm-hmm. with, with to the degree that he was um, uh, appeared unhinged. Kirk had a very healthy social life and and was not not a recluse, but he was private, and to that degree they were they were similar. But but uh, Howard Hughes was uh, when he came to Las Vegas in a major way in investing in casinos. At about the same time, Kirk built his first uh, casino, a hotel. And Kirk's project was the International Hotel, the biggest hotel in the world at the time. And Howard was behind the scenes trying to do everything he could to prevent Kirk from building. Because as far as Howard Hughes was concerned, Las Vegas wasn't big enough for, the, for, two, for two giants. And that's how he perceived Kirk. So he was... Putting out the word to the bankers, don't uh, don't help this guy, or you'll never have my business. And he's putting out. Uh, he, he was trying to uh, uh, provide, trying to offer uh, incentives for Kirk to, to pull up stakes and bail out. Um, and and uh, the Atomic Energy Commission's uh, nuclear testing off outside of Las Vegas was a. Uh, uh, a source of concern for Howard Hughes, uh, who tried to use it to again scare scare Kirk off from um, from investing heavily in Las Vegas in the early days. But uh, Kirk, through it all, was uh, was unaware, first of all, that Howard was trying to submarine him that way, because as far as Kirk was concerned, he was a uh, he and, and Howard had a lot in common. 
But uh, he found out later that uh, that Howard Hughes was a, a major force trying to uh, trying to uh, intercept and and, and discredit his um, his investments even before he could do them. Uh, as we finish up in the last couple of uh, thirty seconds or so of this segment, was he naive? He seemed I, throughout the, uh, this book. You see a theme of he's trusting or he's he's thinking he's he that he's the, the guy on the other side of the table that they're together, et cetera. Well, I think there was a, an element of uh, naivete, but. But uh, if you assume that he didn't understand what was going on, you'd make a big mistake. <laughs> we'll be right back. This is Business Talk with Jim Campbell over the Business Talk Radio Network, 350 stations around the country. Go to biztalkradio.com. Find the one closest to you. Listen over the Internet. More on Kirk Kerkorian coming your way next. And we're back with longtime investigative journalist William Rempel. And we're going to get into a little bit of the, more on the backstory of Kirk, but I wanted to finish off on some of his characteristics that really stick out. And this is another one that's different than Hughes. Um, talk about what a visionary he was, this whole leisure industry vision, et cetera. Yeah, well, the, the, his, his original investments, after he had made his first fortune, which he made selling his, um, his long, long nurse to long uh, charter airline, uh, he pocketed something in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 million dollars, and in, and he pocketed for about two seconds, and he turned around and put it in play, uh, gambling on purchases of MGM, a a struggling at the time uh, film company, uh, Western Airlines, which was a regional uh, carrier, and uh, and building the International Hotel in Las Vegas which he started with uh, the funds he had for, for construction that did not include funds to finish it. So he had put, yeah. so here he had these three, th- three things um, underway, and that was, um, that was a gamble, each, each one of them was. Um, the anxiety issue, the social anxiety issue, I, I don't know whether it was OCD or, or whatever, can you sort of ex- explain what that is or in, rela- in relation to him? Well, he he was petrified of yeah. speaking in public. Uh, that that would nothing would scare him more than that. Um, and and I think it, it it goes back to the fact that he was an eighth grade dropout from school, and he never had confidence that he had the the um, uh, education uh, or the, the the command of the language that that uh, he needed to to sound uh, sound educated. He was a man of who was self-taught, and he, you know, of course, he he was a, a very able aviator, and uh, that required some great math skills. But he was never confident of his speaking, or his language, or his or his smarts, for that matter. Uh, which was surprising, since he was such a brilliant um, visionary who saw things, saw, saw all these different different things that uh, he could do. It is. And you think those of us on the outside, no one looked at him as uneducated or anything like that. So no, exactly. I'll, I'll exactly. This was, this was a, a, an insecurity that he, was, yes. that he carried into his, through his entire life. Uh, he also had, I like this one, Tom, a real on-time fanaticism, but he carried only like, what did you say, the face of a Timex? <laughs> That's right. He didn't have, you know, he took, took it off the strap and just put the face in his pocket and carried it along. And uh, that was, but he he didn't. It wasn't like he checked it constantly. He would ask people what time it was who were with him, and you know, so there was a, it was an odd thing. But he he was someone who, if you were on time, you were late already. Um, he expected people to be early, and he expected to be early himself. And so his people always knew that um, when they had a departure at the time of uh, noon, you were going to be there and ready to go at eleven thirty at least, if not sooner. Sound like Tom Coughlin here in New York, the, the yeah. uh, Giants head coach. Yeah, well, there you go. It's, he he uh, even set the clocks ahead in the uh, – <laughs> now, uh, one other thing uh, that I think uh, you, we need to discuss is his charitable uh, giving, uh, incredibly generous and anonymously. Yes. He was like the, uh, the old TV show, The Millionaire. He would give uh, – he gave generously to lots of causes, but every, everyone with a caveat, you can't tell anybody that I did this or you'll never get another dime. And so everybody was very careful to protect his anonymity. This, this continued for much of his career um, until, until uh, the late 80s when he formed his, um, his, his charity, his charitable trust, uh, Lindsay, the Lindsay Foundation. 
And he did that because he wanted to be more open about helping the Armenians that, uh, after a major earthquake, devastated the country. And uh, he had given anonymously to some Armenian causes, but no one knew it. And there were, there were actually complaints in the Armenian press that this richest man of, of Armenian background was, was doing nothing, when actually he'd been giving millions of dollars already. And I think you say in the book he gave a billion and a half dollars away over his lifetime. Exactly. And then when he died, money. he left the two billion that was in his pocket when he died and left that to charity, too. Um, how did he get the mob out of Vegas? Or he, did he, he didn't work with the mob or what? Well, the mob built Vegas. So uh, remember, uh, traditional banks did not make loans to casinos in, the, in back in the 50s and 60s, when in 40s, 50s, 60s, when the when uh, Las Vegas was was built and, and booming originally. And so um, when Howard Hughes came to town and, and uh, Kirk Kerkorian, they came with their own funds. They didn't need the mob yeah. uh, like the others did. Uh, so, you know, the, the Teamsters St- Central States Pension Fund that had financed the construction of, of uh, casinos from Bugsy Siegel to... Uh, uh, to, to, to Meyer Lansky's days, and all through that period, those people were, were building Las Vegas with mob money. All of a sudden, the skim wasn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't appropriate. Um, stockholders were the, the, new, the new bosses of Las Vegas, and that's because of Kirk and, and Howard. I want to ask you some about uh, some of the folks that uh, that he dealt with over time. First off, the deal he did with Elvis is pretty uh, stunning back in the day. Yeah, Elvis. Elvis was one of he, when he when he opened the International Hotel, the biggest hotel in the world at the time. It opened with uh, Barbara Streisand and then Elvis Presley back to back, and uh, it it turned out to be great for. Barbara Streisand and Elvis Presley, as well as Kirk and and uh, the people that behind the, uh, the International. In fact, you could say that every um, every Elvis impersonator that's that's yeah. ever lived since then is has to thank Kirk Kerkorian for the fact that that even happened, that they exist. You know, the, the, and this is an example of, of the other stuff is that the the amount of money he paid uh, Elvis in that deal, I mean, was completely stunning. And there's a, a quote, I guess, of his in the book: "You have the smaller the bet, the more you lose when you win." Yeah, he did the right. same thing. He built these huge hotels that were t- uh, a multiple of the rooms of the ones that were there that weren't doing well. <laughs> you know? Exactly, exactly, and that's part of his visionary uh, sense is that he he saw Las Vegas. The potential for Las Vegas to be be huge, even when it was struggling at the time, and uh, it was the same in the movie world and with MGM, he saw he saw the uh, the, the outdated use of, um, of of the back lot, for instance, and so he was willing to he knew that he could sell that off and turn that into a really valuable real estate instead of having to keep this warehouse in the back because nobody was using it except as storage. And he recognized the value of the uh, in the movie world of that library of old movies, even before there was a um, uh, a cable television uh, empire to take advantage of it, which was soon to come. But he was seeing that he was seeing these things around the corner, yeah. um, and that was part of his his genius. Uh, we have one minute to go on this segment. Talk a little bit about um, the Agassi family and the impact he had, and eventually on Andre Agassi, right? Yeah, well, Mike Agassi, who is Andre's father, um, was a, a, a waiter, uh, a, a captain uh, in uh, at the hotels and casinos uh, in Las Vegas. And Kirk met him in, uh, and, and discovered they were bo- both had interests in boxing and tennis. And, and in fact, Mike Agassi gave uh, gave Kirk some tennis lessons back in the you know in the day. So they became really good friends and. Um, uh, when, when, uh, when Mike had his had Andre, when his his wife had Andre, the uh, they gave him a middle name of Kirk. So Andre Kirk Agassi uh, is a tribute to that friendship between Mike and Kirk Kikorian. Pretty cool. Listening to business talk with Jim Campbell, we'll look at some of the deals in the messy personal life in our third segment. We're 
back with Bill Rumpel, the author of The Gambler, How Penalists Drop Out Kirk Kerkorian Became the Greatest Dealmaker in Capitalist History. And we're talking deals that uh, upended Hollywood, Las Vegas, and Detroit. Um, and, you know, um, uh, we'll get to the Hollywood and, and Vegas. I want to jump to the cars just for a sec because I found that the most fascinating you know, when I got to know who this guy was. He took a run at Chrysler. Uh, I think twice with Lee Iacocca on one of them at least, and then yes. GM. Talk about the uh, there and why didn't he go all the way? Well, he he actually went after Chrysler. He wanted to take it private. Yes, take it, uh, and he and, and Lee Iacocca uh, teamed up for that, and they expected actually, uh, perhaps naively, but they expected that the management would come along because it was such a good idea at the time financially, and uh, this. this this turned out to, to, to Kirk's surprise to have the uh, the management quite adamantly opposed. And in the aftermath, it, it, it seems that the opposition was primarily because the folks at Chrysler were unwilling to uh, engage in any kind of deal with Leo Iacocca, who they, the management considered a rivals to them. So that's why it didn't go. But but it, but Kirk, as as usual, had. Uh, had other plan when when the plan wasn't working well. He had other tactics that he was switched to because he he was um, he was a man who always had multiple tactics in mind. And uh, it, this this one of the things about this one that was so amazing is that Kirk um, failed. It was a, a, a rare failure at that point for him trying to take something over, take over a company. He usually was successful, but his in failure he ended up with a profit. Of two point seven billion dollars, and so I've always thought, well, when you fail and make two two point seven billion, that's a pretty amazing deal. It's a pretty amazing deal. Did did he did he feel? I mean, he would be charged with being a green mailer or a corporate raider, you know, taking the mm-hmm. money and run. Did he didn't see himself that way though? No, right? and absolutely not. He saw it as a. In fact, he saw it as a huge disappointment. Yeah. Because had it had he been able to had he succeeded, uh, he knew that he would have made something on an order of six to. Six, seven, eight billion dollars, and uh, and it would have been better for the company in his mind. So, in fact, he sued. He sued in federal court. Um, yes, against the Daimler Daimler Benz uh, folks that uh, that uh, that ended up taking control of Chrysler at the time, because he thought they did it under false pretenses, and he lost money. And so, and they did do it under false pretenses. He, well, they did, <laughs> but the but the judge was uh, not sympathetic when he saw how much Kirk had had profited. He found it um, difficult to award him any kind of uh, uh, payments for um, for lost uh, theoretical loss loss income. Now, what happened with General Motors? Because um, there again, he folded, but he also lost money here. Yeah, uh, well, actually, uh, with General Motors, it, it more he made a little on that. It wasn't, but it wasn't what he intended. It was Ford is one where he again he, he oh, lost yes. substantially with yes. Ford. And uh, in both cases, it was more timing than anything. Uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, with Ford, he was trying to he was investing into the uh, into the recession, um, and uh, and and even then, his his uh, financial people thought that if he could have just hung on a little longer, uh, if he had not not bailed, he probably still would have come out ahead. But but he he was I, something about. Automobiles that really appealed to him. It was a, a throwback to his um, his youth yeah. when he was a he 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 used to make make a few dollars by refurbishing used cars when he and uh, you know, steam cleaning the engines and things like that. And used planes a, too. And well, yeah. and with planes, it was a big deal. Yeah. I mean, he he probably kept his commercial his his charter airline was kept afloat by. By timely sales and um, uh, of, of of junk airplanes, he was the Sanford and Sons of junk airplanes. All right, let's go to Hollywood now. Uh, you, you know the charge is always asset stripping. That you know he cut production, he sold off land, he sold all the artifacts off. I mean the Wizard of Oz shoes, you know Dorothy's shoes. Even um, did he did he see himself as a liquidator liquidator that way? And then the second part, why did he trade these things all the time instead of keeping them? Well, he was not a man of, you know, keep in mind that he was a poor kid. He didn't have things. He grew up without things. He grew up moving all the time. And mm-hmm. so he, he, he learned the, the, to value uh, friends and family, not 
things and uh, did not accumulate things. So <laughs> there's a certain lack of sentimentality, uh, I'm sure, uh, toward uh, property. And you saw the back lot as a yeah. uh, completely outdated, uh, obsolete uh, thing. And, uh, and it was taking up space and it was taking, uh, taking up costs. So that's what he saw. Now, he's, he, he, um, Debbie Reynolds, uh, he made Debbie Reynolds cry. That yeah. was, she was such a, such a, a fan of the, of the iconic, uh, iconic elements of Hollywood that she, she tried to save herself. And and it's you know it 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 made him the most hated man in Hollywood, no question about it. But he saw it as a cost, not a benefit. And the co- the benefits he saw were the were the uh, the artistic work, the the films themselves, and the, and the real estate. And he kept selling the stuff. Um, he kept buying the stuff for a good price and then selling it back to the same people well, at, a lower, right. at a lower price. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. He, and in fact, you know, he, with, with, with Ted Turner, he, he, he sold him yeah. everything and then kept buying back pieces. Uh, so he, he ended up owning, owning it again. Anyway, he bought and sold it three different <laughs> times, every time for a profit. And, in, and I think it was after the last sale when he sold it to, uh, to Sony, is when uh, the New York Times called him the god of all deal makers. All right, let's move a little bit to the personal life. I mean, he seems like a, such a man of integrity and quiet certitude and has ends up with all these sort of disaster things. I guess talk about the fake paternity Lisa Bonder first. Yeah, well, in this case, uh, I mean, he, he was always, his private life was very private. Uh, he'd, he would be... Noted when he went out, he went out in public with uh, various starlets and friends and and lovers, and uh, that that and, and they would make the social columns or the gossip columns. But but it, it, there was never any controversy, never any scandal. And uh, until until the uh, Lisa Bonder, who was a, a tennis professional for a while, um, she. Uh, falsified a DNA test to, to make her baby appear to be Kirk's, uh, Kirk, the father of her baby, a little girl. Jeez. And uh, he did this. She did this by using one of Kirk's, um, uh, bio, his only biological daughter, uh, getting, getting essentially talking this ki- uh, daughter into uh, sh- sharing a, uh, a saliva test under false premises, false purposes. Anyway, it, it was a. Uh, she took it. She took him to court um, uh, to to get more support for this baby that wasn't his, and um, it ended up becoming a, a the fodder for uh, for scandal in the in the tabloid. And interestingly, he didn't mind supporting the kid. It was his privacy that he was bothered, and she was incredibly greedy, right? I mean, she wanted well, one point a million bucks a year or a month or something. Uh, a month, a month, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Jeez. yeah. Um, yeah, he was paying fifty thousand a month uh, at the time. And uh, and no, he didn't mind. He he actually accepted uh, legal paternity. I mean, he actually signed a, a, a document that accepted paternity, even though he knew he wasn't the father. And, um, uh, and and he promised that he would take care of this little girl and for the rest of her life. And uh, this this was this was okay uh, to him because it was money. It, as he he as only a billionaire can say if if. Uh, if a problem can be solved with money, it's not a problem. So um, he and he accepted that in the case of of uh, this this of this uh, child that he would take care of her, treat her as his own daughter, and uh, and 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 provide uh, the monthly support that was extraordinary by most of our standards. But inter- what inter- happened then is that the, that the the mother uh, Lisa uh, filed. For more support, uh, increased support for incredible sums, and she did it in open court as opposed to family court, where it became a public, a public case, and that that cost Kirk the one thing that he cared for the most, and that was privacy. That's what hit me the most is that he he didn't mind paying these ridiculous sums to this woman that was basically blackmailing him, but he yeah. couldn't deal with um, um, the, the loss of privacy. When he when he divorced, I think his first wife Peggy, he has he goes into deep depression and even has electroshock therapy. Right? Yeah, yeah, he was 
his uh, his romantic life was uh, had its ups and downs. That's for sure, um, and because he was very devoted to the first wife by all accounts, um, and his second wife, Jean, they were married for nearly thirty years. Yeah. So you know, it, it wasn't he, he didn't have the scandalous um, um, lifestyle. It was a you know he was a billionaire who was very popular. He was very good looking and fit, physically fit, uh, right up until his ninety into his nineties. I was impressed. Yeah, he was actually playing tennis, and he he was he he was upset that his body was slowing down at ninety. <laughs> the first yeah. time he said he noticed, I'm sixty, and I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell. You can see our uh, YouTube version. Go to search Business Talk with Jim Campbell, or go to Park City Productions 06604. We'll talk lessons from Kirk in our final national segment. This is the author of a new book on dealmaker Kirk Kerkoria, and that's Bill Rempel. And um, before we get into messages, uh, tell us um, what his net worth ended up. Because I was stunned he had this huge pay, uh, project in Vegas that got hit by the 08 crash, and he lost a huge chunk of his wealth. Yeah, I think he lost something like, I don't know, $15 billion, and he was still a billionaire. <laughs> he still had $3 billion left, apparently. That's pretty close, yeah. All right, let's talk about some of the messages that I took away. What a, he, he had, he put importance on failure. What, what does that mean? Well, his uh, failure is what I think, uh, and it was his early days of failure. The, the failure being his family's uh, difficulties. They were they were being evicted not just from the ranch, but they couldn't pay the rent in the houses when they moved to L.A. So Kirk was constantly uh, having to move and be the new kid in school, the new uh, new new neighborhoods, new friends. And I, that that experience uh, of losing and, and uh, failing, even if it's not him personally, but the fact that you have nothing and have all this uncertainty, gave him a certain um, sort of comfort with risk. And how bad can it be? You know, when you, you you're vir- on the verge of homeless uh, so many times in his life. So I think those those experiences of failure um, gave him comfort in making risky moves all through his career how do you how do you uh, explain how he uh, how he got what his philosophy or his comfort with risk and uncertainty and taking big risks but they were calculated risks he, he wasn't a gambler in the sense that he was just throwing you know money on the table no that's right he except occasionally um but uh but his 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 risks were calculated he in 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 vegas he calculated the odds he was he, he understood the odds very well and craps was his favorite favorite game because he knew how to play it. Um, in 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 business, he did his homework. The man w- did not rely on MBAs and uh, and and investment reports, any of that. He did his own homework, and he knew what he was after and knew what potentials were um, on his own. And so uh, he he would his his pre- preparedness before taking a, uh, taking a an investment risk was extraordinary. I like, by the way, there's a, a story in the book where Bear Stearns comes in and says, we prepared this huge analysis on whatever he was doing. And Kirk said, great. Could you just keep it? Yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. Didn't, he didn't want to hear it. Yeah. Either. Well, in fact, the, uh, that, that the fellow that prepared that uh, complained to his boss uh, uh, that uh, Kirk, he doesn't listen to me. He doesn't, <laughs> you know, I, I tried to give him some advice and the boss said, Never tell Babe Ruth how to hold the bat. That's Ace Greenberg, right? Mm, that's the, right. The legendary guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, another big thing, I think, is your, your, uh, his whole deal, your word is your bond. He didn't even need contracts. Exactly. In fact, he would sometimes say, I, just don't let, the, don't let the lawyers screw this up. Because when he shook your hand, you had a deal. The deal was whatever you had agreed on, and, and everybody knew it. And all through his life, unlike his father, who had gotten overextended and, and defaulted on lots of loans, Kirk never did. He 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 considered protecting his reputation one of the one of the main things of life you had to do and he was so careful from the earliest days at protecting his reputation and his his uh, his credit that uh, he never had a problem getting getting <laughs> getting a loan this was uh, in, in the tens of millions of dollars on his signature even in the early days uh, before before he was a billionaire do you think it's important, uh, the component that, that he's really an immigrant success story in this period that we're in right now, which is, you know, sort of leaning anti-immigrant? Oh, yeah. Kirk is the, 
Kirk's family could not have come into this country today if uh, they were they were poor, they were illiterate, they were unskilled. Uh, <laughs> they were, they, these were these were not um, uh, the kind of immigrants that uh, that that the uh, anti-immigrant crowd is looking for. Uh, they did not have special special skills of any kind. And so had had they been denied entry, there would be no Kirk Kikorian, and that would have been one of the biggest losses of uh, in business in our country. Interesting. How do you explain his competitive nature that, you know, that tennis until he was 90 and, and, and never backed down, but yet he was so fair? Yeah, well, he, he loved competition. It comes back to that, and he, he loved fair competition. And he did it in an early age. He was uh, he was a boxer, an amateur boxer. He got the got the nickname Rifle Right Kokorian mm-hmm. after his one of his early early victories, and and he loved boxing. And he always and, and tennis became his next love, uh, as it, which he took up when he was like 50 years old. But he loved the competition, and he played played it competitively. Um, in his backyard, and he played it competitively. Competitively on the senior circuit, when he was in his 80s, he was he was a a, a ranked player on the senior circuit. Do you think? Uh, I think in this Donald Trump time that we're in, that we would probably benefit from more humility and less hubris. Oh, definitely, <laughs> yeah. Now that's that would be Kirk. Uh, Kirk's yeah, device, I'm sure. Exactly. I mean, he's he, Kirk. See, Kirk. One of the, one of the things that that was typical of Kirk is he would not talk about himself. Um, when somebody would ask him uh, his advice for how to be successful, he wouldn't. He refused to answer. He would say, "I don't know. I, I don't. I can't tell you how to do it." Um, it but it was all humility and lack of ego. Um, he was proud of what he accomplished. He he really was. But he wouldn't even tell say that talk about that except in the privacy of his family and friends. Um, so uh, to to say that he was a polar opposite of. Donald yeah. Trump is is to understate it. He also hated to fire people. Kirk did. I mean, so so much for the uh, uh, for the for the apprentice. Yeah, he wouldn't have quite have made it on there. The um, I, I it always impressed me. He gave hundreds of millions of dollars um, for the Armenian genocide and the earthquake, and he wouldn't even allow a bench to be named after. Oh, him, that's right? right. No, he he would. He didn't want. He didn't want any any kind of uh, celebrity, uh, any kind of of, uh, of tribute. He didn't even like dinner parties uh, in his honor. Um, and you'll notice in Las Vegas, where Kirk owned most of the largest hotels over time, his name is not on any of them. Yeah. Uh, and and you know he didn't even put his name on his parking spot at MGM. So he he didn't do that. And, and just like Trump, right? Trump doesn't have his name on any buildings, does he? Oh no, not <laughs> only in only in you know twenty foot letters. <laughs> yes, you know I'm. Um, I like the the, uh, the the humble man uh, sort of summary, or, or, or this is a great line for it that's in the book. He took the risks, but not the credit. That's right, and that's what some that's what his people saw, and that's why the loyalty of Kirk's Kirk's people was extraordinary. He didn't have to demand loyalty; he he commanded it with uh, with living living a life that, that shared the credit uh, and took good care of people who, uh, who who were loyal to him, and it was. It was a mutual affection society. Well, I tell you, I learned a lot uh, in this book, Bill. Really enjoyable. He's, he seems a tremendous uh, human being. The book is The Gambler, How Penniless Dropout Kirk Kerkorian Became the Greatest Dealmaker in Capitalist History. This has been Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Get our podcast at iTunes, biztalkradio.com, on YouTube. Cork City Productions, 06604. Thanks to William Rempel. Thanks to our national audience for listening. We'll see everybody next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell.